Welcome to Down to Earth Astrology with Primal Girl Wellness. This is Miss Jenny and I am your astrologer. So today we're doing an uh, introductory short video for Ms. Lilibet Diana Mountbatten Windsor, the girl with many, many names. <laughs> Alrighty. So um, today, today's date is July, 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 July 21st. Uh, today is July 21st, and we have, I be don't believe we've seen hide nor hair of Lilibet yet, um, nor have we heard anything, which is a good thing. No news is better than bad news, right? Um, so I figured today would probably be a good day to put this uh, particular brief video out, because come the middle of August, she does some have some activity in her chart, and I suspect that that is when we will get her first public appearance. Um, so let's see if the chart runs on time and if the predictions are going to play out uh, as expected. So let's get on with the show. Okay, so I'm going to start this video with the most unsettling, disturbing thought possible so we can just get that out of the way, right? So what do Lily Mountbatten Windsor and Donald Trump have in common? Hmm, bet you didn't see that coming. Well, both of the charts have 29 Leo rising, if you're one of these people that believes Donald Trump is 29 Leo rising. They both have the Sun and Gemini in the 10th house. They both have their Mercury squaring Neptune and Venus in Cancer and a moon in a fire sign. That's a lot of similarities between these charts. Kind of scary, right? I bring these two up because there's something very important I want you guys to keep in mind when you're looking at charts. You know, we've got billions of people on the planet and it's not unthinkable that many of us are going to share the same planets and signs or planets and aspects with each other or a combination of things. It's There's only 10 planets to work with and so many signs and houses and aspects we can kind of run through here. At some point, it's going to overlap and many of us are going to share the same things. However, the similarity is mostly stopping there. So the thing to remember when you're looking at a chart is that much like making, um, well, making anything, if I give you eggs and uh, salt and flour and vanilla extract and baking soda or whatever, d different combinations of things are going to give you different outcomes. So the difference between a biscuit, a pancake, and a birthday cake is literally de de determined by the amount of ingredients we use in what order and the circumstances or temperature that we're baking this thing in. Same thing with the chart, right? So even though Lily and uh, Donald have similar, unfortunately, two, some remarkably similar elements in their charts, hopefully they're not going to turn out and walk down the same path. On an evolutionary level, they may have the same drives or demands. For instance, they both have the sun in the 10th house. The sun in the 10th house is going to give both of these personalities a desire and a drive to achieve a higher level of status that is considered respect worthy by other people. How they get that, how they approach that, and what they do with it once they have it are very, very different conversations than we're having when we just talk about the sun in the 10th house. Moon and fire signs are always very, um, very warm and a little impulsive and you know uh, very fiery and you know they're you know prone to a little hyperbole right a little exaggeration and the moon and fire sign is always very quick to react they're quick to judge quick to love quick to hate quick to forgive they're quick to do everything right because fire cannot sustain itself over long periods of time right and we know with both well we don't know about lily yet but we know with uh, 45 that he's very quick to react sometimes before that little teeny tiny hamster wheel brain of his has a chance to engage Woo! but that's the moon fire sign are quick response people they both have um venus and cancer well venus and cancer hangs on to things it's very sentimental and it's also uh, very self-protective, right? So Venus and Cancer is very protective of themselves and who they consider their tribe. And when they say tribe, they mean their immediate, immediate, tight, 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 close family, right? So for Trump, it would be himself first, <laughs> his kids second, and his wives third. Although I got to say, Ivana, the first wife, is always going to be his family as far as he's concerned. 
Um, the other two after that, I'm sure he could, he could live without. So Lily or Lilibet will be the same way. She's going to be very self-protective of her feelings. And she, with that, she's going to be very protective of the people she is considers her personal tribe, which will be her immediate family. So in these ways, this is where they share the same things in common. Now, where these things are different, obviously, again, has to do with how they uh rise up to their challenges and how they express these planetary energies, you know, and whether they, you know, succeed or fail in the evolutionary demands of becoming the better person that they can be. With Trump, remember, uh, his full, his fire sign moon, that moon in the fire sign is also part of an opposition with that 10th house sun and Uranus conjuncting the sun. So right there, we've got, with the sun Uranus in the 10th house for him, we've got somebody who likes to take shortcuts. They're very impatient. Um, and they really like to see themselves as special beyond special, exceptional in ways that other people could only hope, hope to rise to. Uh, Sun Uranus in the 10th house is an extremely ego-driven position, and the Uranus makes it difficult sometimes for them to see themselves realistically. And this is most people with Sun Uranus. Now, is everybody with Sun Uranus in the 10th completely delusional like he is? No, but it's the similar thing where they don't, their measure of standard for themselves and how they see themselves is not the same as the world sees them. With his fire sign moon opposing that and that Uranus involved, it makes it even more impulsive and impatient. So he, that combination right there is going to give him a lot of impetus, impetus to look for shortcuts to get to the top, which we've seen over and over and over again. And that impatience we're going to see with people who share that planetary combination, the desire to take shortcuts, maybe or maybe not, depending on what else is going on in their chart, but certainly uh, an overriding desire to get there faster will be present in all parties. He has uh, Venus conjunct Saturn in his chart in Cancer, which makes him cruel and selfish. Um, and sometimes a bit psychologically or emotionally sadistic. It's not, that's not a happy placement. And with his chart and everything else in it, that's where we're getting the sadism and the cruelty because it's the other things factored in the chart that creates a specific type of profile prone to that type of behavior. This is not Lily's situation. She has Venus in Cancer, but she does not have Saturn conjuncting her Venus and she does not have a full moon chart with that fire sign moon of hers. So even though there are things that are similar between the charts, they're not going to be the same people. And I would ask that all of you remember that when you look at other people's charts through the lens of astrology. And just a quick reminder. So with astrology, there's a saying in, psycho in psychotherapy, a psychologist made this quote, it's a beautiful quote, and that is the map is not the territory. So what you see on paper or academically, or as an outsider looking in, is not the same thing as the experience of actually being that person or being in that situation. There's a lot more going on than you're gonna see on the surface. So on the left side of this image, we have a map of the Panama Canal. That's the map. On the right is the picture of the ship Evergreen that got stuck in the Panama Canal just recently. Uh, which has never been done before. So odd circumstances and coincidence all align to get this poor ship stuck in the canal for weeks. That's the territory. The map on the left could not have prepared or warned us of the territory that we're dealing with on the right. So again, the map is what you see on the surface as somebody looking at it from the outside. The territory is the actual experience of the person or the circumstances the person find themselves in. These are not the same conversations. So when you look at astrology, remember, astrology is the map, not the territory. Or in the more most simple terms, never judge a book by its cover or its astrology chart. Here we go. We've got a brand new human being on the planet. And the first thing as astrologers that we want to know is who is this human being that has joined us on this cosmic cruise ship called planet Earth? So we want to get the birth information. We want to set the chart up and we want to get into it, baby. Let's see what we got here. What are we working with? Totally get it. Totally get it. But if you're going to read a child's chart, whether it's an infant or anybody under the age of 18, there are versus an adult, there are some things you really want to keep in mind so that you do the least amount of damage. And believe me, you can do some damage with this. And I'll explain why in a minute. 
So the first thing to remember is that when you're dealing with somebody who's not an adult yet, somebody who has not moved out of their house, who has not, their brain hasn't finished developing, which by the way, does not finish developing until you're 22. Your brain literally is not finished set, like setting itself like a jello mold <laughs> until you're 22. And surprise, guess which part of the brain is the last part to develop, right? Impulse control. I swear to God. Okay. So the thing about it is until you pass that threshold and you're officially set like a jello mold into who you're going to be as an adult in your life for the most part like as far as what you're working with you're very until then you are very malleable you're very impressionable and so are your parents so when we do charts for people un, that are not adults yet there's a lot of influence we can have one way or the other and there's a lot of positive or negative impact we can have on someone's image of themselves and that is a very big deal when we're talking about <clears throat> acting as the voice of authority about who someone really is based on you know the cosmic map. So keep that in mind. And the other thing is this, when you're reading the chart for an adult, it's different because an adult knows when you're full of crap. Okay. They know when you're literally projecting all your personal issues onto them and your lens of perception is really dirty, grimy, twisted, and you got some wacko stuff coming out of you that has nothing to do with them and more to do with you. They also know just simply when you're wrong. So <clears throat> as an adult, we have an idea of who we are, right? And we also have some sense of what our limitations are. Um, we may not know what our untapped potential is, but we definitely know what our limitations are. If I am four foot eight, I know I'm never gonna become a professional basketball player unless there's like a midget pro basketball team that's a limitation that i know i'm working with if i'm an adult and i've gone through school and i know that school was hard for me okay and i did not enjoy it at all not because of my teachers but just because of the mental rigors of academic work right because i'm a more hands-on person i know my limitations and one of those limitations is i'm not going to go to postgraduate school for you know some type of stem program and become a nasa engineer not going to happen because it's not in my nature. It's not how I'm wired and I'm I, there's nothing about it that's desirable for me because of those things. So, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff like when you're talking out your hat at people as adults, they, they know who they are mostly, right? And if you find something interesting about them that they're unaware of and they haven't checked out, like they're open to the idea. But when you're throwing stuff at them and you're like, oh no, what are you crazy? Where did that come from? They have the adults have the ability to disagree and say, yeah, no, I don't think so. Youth and children and parents of infants do not have that same safeguard built in. They have no way of saying, oh, no, that's ridiculous. That's that's just are you talking about me or somebody else? They don't have that ability and a skewed or negative or in uh, not inappropriate, but misdirected uh, analysis can be very harmful because these people will assume that you know what you're talking about, will start following paths that are not good for them or work from their weaknesses, not their strengths, or kind of sort of work from their strengths, but are not really conducive to who they could be because you, they've locked into this thing that you've given them that is, that is the interpretation of who they are. And rather than exploring all possibilities in front of them, they stay narrowly focused on this trajectory you've offered in a casual reading. <clears throat> and, um, we're going to talk a lot about this in a second. All right. So <laughs> there's that, you know, so the other thing, a uh, couple of things, when you're dealing with parents of infants and you're reading their chart, remember mm, parents are a little nuts. Parents are a little nuts. And they're, every parent, every good parent is terrified that they're going to do a bad job of raising their child. Every parent wants their child to reach their best possible potential and to have more opportunity and success in life than they have achieved in their own. This isn't to say that the parents are failures. That is to say that all of us, based on the circumstances we find ourselves surrounded by as we, as we go through life, want better for our children. That's kind of the way it works, hopefully. Because of that, parents of infants are particularly 
uh, skittish and sometimes neurotic, depending on the parent. Um, you know, they call them helicopter parents for a reason. There's a whole generation of kids that are growing up not understanding that the world does not revolve around them. And we're not going to stop and take a break because they're having a bad moment. Or maybe, I don't know. It's a the whole different... Ugh, parenting is challenging. And through generations, we've had many, many different extremes of styles and methods of parenting that have been given to us by um, quote unquote experts that were not great. Um, and literally one extreme of bad to the other extreme. So we're all sorting it out. So you as a contributor to <laughs> the parenting experience of this child, uh, you have vested interest in making sure you keep in mind at all times that while you're reading the chart for the child, it's actually the parent you've got to worry about, not the kid. So remind parents before you start that your child is, or their child rather, is a spiritually complete person. And that is not the same thing as being a fully formed identity of a person. So spiritually, we've got a map in front of us or a blueprint that shows us the mile markers and high points and, and experiences that we have to have to help us develop into the best possible version of ourselves before we get out of the here and leave the planet. As individuals, we are not fully formed people with identities. Identity formation is not based on what you see in the chart. Identity formation is what you see in the chart, the parents and their contributions, as well as the external world around us. These three things come together and mix with each other. And that is what creates identity in this lifetime. You can have two people with identical charts which would indicate that they're having identical life paths. But the reality is one person has a set of circumstances and support systems and opportunities available to them that the other one does not, which means that as these two people with nearly identical charts, right? And they could be born in completely different places on the planet. As these two people with nearly identical charts grow into their identity in this world, that identity is not necessarily going to look the same, or even by a, a mile, right? It could be completely 180 degree difference between the two of them because it's not just the chart. It's the parenting in the early environment. That's the nurture, right? As well as the circumstances and the world around them that contributes to what they can accomplish in this lifetime. That's also nurture and the spiritual or evolutionary demands inside the chart where they have to hit certain experiences and mile markers to become more of who they are essentially. And that's the nature part. So when people ask you if there's such a, if there's a difference between nature and nurture, understand that yes, there is. And that both of these things are equally true. We are not products of one or the other. We are products of both. Okay. Now, uh, let me do this. Let me get through this a little bit quickly. Okay. <laughs> So first thing to remember, one, the map is not the territory. Like the chart is the map, but that's not the territory or the lived experience. So what you see in a chart, we, especially with youth, we want to be very careful how we address this and how we talk about this because youth and the parents of, of youth don't have the ability to say for sure, well, that's not my identity. That's wrong. You're wrong. You're crazy. That's you and your projections and your biases because the, the child or youth has not fully developed yet. So this, which brings me to the second thing, you need to own your biases. You need to own your biases and your prejudices. You need to really be honest with yourself about where your issues are. Okay. And if you say you don't have any, you definitely have huge ones and you don't need to be reading other people's charts. Um, you want to check your biases and your own personal issues before you start reading charts of other people, especially children, especially children, because you are the voice of authority. And without realizing it, you can make a huge impact in negative ways in terms of how this child identifies themselves, right? Or how they see themselves or worse, how their parents see them. Because the parents could either expect too much from the child in all the wrong ways because they've interpreted what you said completely differently than the way you intended, or they could see the child in very negative ways uh, and, you know, treat the child as if they're a criminal before they've ever cr committed a crime because people are not rational human beings. And at the end of the day, you're still dealing with people, right? Even though they're parents, they're still people with all the flaws that go with being people. All right. And um, this brings me to <laughs> P 
people will live up or down to the expectations of the world around them. So here's the thing. Remember, we've got the parents or the people or caregivers, and then we have the, the external world. So if our caregivers have an expectation of us and it matches what the world expects of us, we're going to have a much easier time in life. We will easily live up to those expectations because everything is in alignment and supportive of us becoming this thing that people expect from us. If the parents expect one thing from us, but the world outside that family door um, expects something completely different or something much less, then it's going to be very difficult to break past the expectations and the handicaps of the external world to rise above those things. So for example, if you are, um, I don't know, it, it picks something, anything, right? So imagine that you are a child of poor parents and you happen to be the minority in whatever group you live in, right? So maybe you live in Tonga and you're not a Tonga native, uh, but you're some ethnic minority living in Tonga, right? So your parents have very strong, positive expectations for you. They expect you to succeed in life, become, you know, comfortable and functional and do all the right things because this is what they want for you. But the outside world, because you are an unfavorable minority in this area that you're living in, in this case, we're saying whatever it is in Tonga, that's not a Tonganese. Um, and they have a very negative prejudice against people who are not Tongas. In that environment, it's going to be very difficult for you to live up to the expectations of your parents because the external world is not going to support that. The external world is going to continue trying to push you into or back down into their expectation of you, right? They're not going to support you being anything but what they expect from you. So it's a harder fight and a bigger climb to become something else or something greater than what the world around you is expecting from you because you are whatever. The same thing works the other way, right? So maybe your parents have very limited negative expectations of you, right? Even though the world around you has very high expectations from you. Maybe you're very attractive. Maybe you're born into the right family with, you know, the right resources. The world around you expects you to be functional, if not successful, because you've got all the best cards, you know, played out for you from birth. But if your parents inside the home have a lower expectation of you, right? They don't expect you to do well. They don't expect you to achieve anything in life. Maybe you're a girl and you're in one of these families that doesn't see women as good for anything except making babies and, you know, taking care of the house and, you know, slaving after a husband, right? In those types of environments, regardless of everything that you have going for you, you might have a high IQ, you might be attractive, you've got all the resources, you're born in the right families and, you know, all sorts of opportunities and support systems externally around you that can help you achieve great things in life. But if your family has a low expectation of you, meaning that this is who they think you should be, they're never going to give you the supports you need to get past that and achieve what you could outside of that house and their expectations it's an even more difficult climb when parents have low expectations of you because they are your first experience with someone having confidence in your abilities until you have confidence in your own. So when I say that people live up or down to the expectations of the world around them, understand that this is what they do. We will live up or down to our parents' expectations as well as we will live up or down to the expectations of the world when we walk outside the house. When these th two things are in congruence, we will become exactly what both of these parties expect from us, good or bad. When these things are incongruent, that's where the challenge becomes for a lot of people because we have to fight our way through this jungle of bad negative influence and expectation and find a way to get past that hurdle and become more of who we are. Right. And this is where the beauty of astrology comes in, because we can see potentials there and reinforce the positive things that people can strive for with more authority than the parents or caregivers and the world, because astrology has no bias. It has no prejudice. The only bias or prejudice in astrology is the astrologer themselves. So with that said, check your biases before you start working on other people's charts. And the last thing I would say is if you have to say anything that is negative, right, or questionable 
um, especially about the outcome of something, be very mindful of what the value systems of the parents are or the person involved, and also your own, right? Uh, and I'm gonna give you a couple of stories. So, uh, one, there was a young boy I knew uh, years and years and years ago, and looking at his chart, he had a huge, huge, huge stellium in Sagittarius. So it was a lot of Sagittarius in this chart. And obviously there were other things going on in the chart, and I can't remember exactly what the planetary positions were, but with that heavy stellium in Sagittarius and all the other things in the chart connecting with it and around it, one of the things that came up when I was looking at the chart, I'm like, dude, I'm like, listen, I don't know what you're going to do with your life, but it looks like you're either going to be in the military and spend a lot of time traveling, or you're going to be in prison spending a lot of time not going anywhere at all. Um, and this was before he was 18, well before he was 18. So I, you know, he was just, he was a, f a friend of my son's and I, you know, I wasn't in close contact with him. Uh, and he, this poor kid really had a hard life. His, oh, I, I don't want to get into this personal stuff, but he had a really, really hard life. So he was born in a poor family, uh, parents divorced, the mother left with all of the children except him who stayed with the father. So I don't know if the biological children of the mother were all by a different father or I, I don't know what that was, but basically he, his mother left with his family unit and left him behind with a father. So, you know, that had to have some effect on him. Right. Um, and you know, poor white trash you know, and all the things that go with it and all the world expectations of who you're never going to be because dude, this is, this is who you're, where you're born and this is who you are. Like get used to it and get in line. We got to go to work. Right. Um, in any event, uh, I didn't see him for years and years and years. And like, I think almost 10, 15 years later, somebody had mentioned him to me. I said, oh, whatever happened to him? Well, come to find out, he did not join the military. He instead ended up in prison uh, or jail and then prison for, and just repeat offenses and all this sort of stuff. So the reason I'm saying this is this, right? Even though uh, there was a distinct possibility of one or the other, right? And we could say that he made a choice or it was inevitable right? Depending on opportunities and circumstances. There's also an issue with confidence. So no matter what I say, if I'm giving him these two potential outcomes in the chart and the world around him, the people around him are reinforcing the negative one, right? Oh, dude. Yeah, no, I don't see you going to military. Yeah, let's go smoke some weed, man. Blah, blah, blah. Um, the people around him are going to pull him in the direction that suits them, which in this case was, you know, all sorts of antisocial behavior that had him ending up in prison. Uh, and it's a very sad and unfortunate story um, because he did get out of prison. His father did try to help him get a job and he went right back to old friends and old ways of doing things, went right back to prison. Um, so we could say that the chart reading was accurate, but more than that, we could also say that the chart reading was not as effective as it could have been because had we maybe been able to give a better chart reading or maybe even not even set that up as an option for him to carry around in the back of his mind, then maybe he would have done something differently and he wouldn't have ended up in prison. We don't know. But this is the thing. When you see things in charts that are not flattering, we've got to be very, very careful how these things are interpreted or more importantly, how they can be misused, right? Uh, so he's not an awful kid. He's, he's really not. Yeah, just he really had a hard life. Um, Anyway, so there's that. Now there's, and that's, he was young, uh, youngish. So he was in his l early teens at the time. And here's another story. There was a uh, psychic fair, right? Because back in the 80s, like psychics and psychic fairs, it was like the big renaissance of the metaphysics. It was a wonderful, fun time if you had a little bit of time and money to throw around. So uh, this astrologer, and this is why I'm not a huge fan of suburban housewife astrologers um, who think they know something when they've lived no life at all. Right, looking at a chart and looking at this woman's chart, she is a minority. <laughs> right, the suburban housewife is white and sheltered, and the girl she's reading is 17 and she's a minority. And she's looking at the hard aspects of the charts. I've seen this chart, right? And this woman actually said to a 17 year old girl, you know, yada, 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 yada. Oh, well, you know, I don't know, maybe, and you know, who knows? Like, looking at this, you could end up a prostitute. <gasps> Who says that to a 17 year old girl? And here's the thing I would say, this is le like lenses of perception and biases and prejudices, right? 
if that had been a boy sitting in front of her, would she have said to a boy with the same chart, oh, well, you know, I don't know, blah, 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 maybe you'll end up a prostitute. Would she have said that? Or would she have said to the boy, oh, I don't know, maybe you'll end up a drug dealer, or maybe you'll end up, you know, a daredevil or a police officer, right? There's a hundred different ways to interpret aspects in a chart. When we go for the most uh, licentious, sensational, or negative ones, this is a really important time to check yourself. Because saying things like that to an impressionable person, and if the person is listening to you read a chart, they are impressionable. The, this is not okay. This is not okay, especially when you're dealing with children and youth, right? That was a horrible, horrible, horrible thing that I saw. And I hope none of you ever pull crap like that. Um, so between that and the whole medical astrology, oh, well, you know, your doctor doesn't know what he's talking about, blah, blah, blah. Um, with some of these suburban astrologers that have way too much time in their hands, well, my brother-in-law is a plastic surgeon, so I know a thing or two about medicine. This was an actual conversation on Facebook. Um, yeah, no, your brother-in-law being a plastic surgeon has nothing to do with you knowing anything about medicine or your head from a hole in the ground. Anyway, much less astrology. So when you do charts, recognize your limitations, definitely check in and own your biases and your prejudices and pull them out before you get started, especially if it's something that is potentially insulting, injurious, or damaging to the psyche or self image of the person you're reading for. Okay. All right. So that's basically the, 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 astrology 101 for child natal astrology so from there let's get started and i mean these are common sense rules for everything but especially more importantly for children all right so let's take a look at what we got okay so here we go this is the chart for lilibet windsor uh or i'm sorry lilibet diana mountbatten windsor <laughs> and the first thing that everybody's going to notice uh is that she has 29 leo rising which is also the fixed star regalis or was now the thing to remember is that your fixed stars move a little bit so technically the fixed star regalis is actually at zero virgo right now it's still close enough to use but technically it's in virgo not leo anymore now with 29 degrees leo rising just the 29th degree rising this usually indicates an impatience to get out um right <laughs> uh, but it also uh usually shows somebody who is going to spend much of their lifetime dealing with a lot of uh, checks put in place that seem to hold them back, hold them back, hold them back, uh, obstacles and obstructions. They will, if they remain consistent and determined to achieve their goals. However, uh, it will not come easy. It will not come easy. So much of the 29 degree rising uh, that you see with people is this sense of urgency that they just need to get past this so they can get on with things, uh, and which is a constant running theme or feeling in their life. Now, with a fixed star regalis, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of high expectations of the regalis, and again, people some people would believe that Trump was 29 regalis rising, and he was not. Um, but the reason they say this is because 29 degrees Leo rising or regalis is often associated with a meteoric rise in life to stations much higher than the person started out as. Now, with our former president becoming president, it's actually not that big a leap. Many of the people in Congress, um, certainly the ones that go on to become, you know, presidents and, all, and senators and all sorts of stuff, like they already started out wealthy and well-connected. So going to president is not that big a promotion from them. Barack Obama is a much better example of t regalist rising than Trump was, um, because Barack Obama did grow up in very humble, modest beginnings and spent most of his life climbing slowly. Uh, but working with very modest resources and support systems and achieved the office of presidency later. Um, the reason it's not regalist rising for him is because it wasn't meteoric. So it wasn't this overnight kind of thing where suddenly he became president. It was a very strong, slow, steady climb. But again, it's the dramatic difference between very modest beginnings and being holding the highest office in the land, which is typically held by the Millionaire and Billionaire Boys Club. Uh, so Trump and all his false billions um, becoming president was not that meteoric a rise. Like it's not that big a deal to become 
a billionaire if you were a millionaire. It's a much bigger deal to become a millionaire if you were living on the streets prior to that. So there's that. Now with her, with Lilibet, one of the things that we would look at with this 29 day rising again is this always this feeling of impatience, like being held back. And if I can just get past this, I can just get on with things sort of stuff. The other is that the important thing to understand about Regalis and 29 Leo Rising is that Regalis or 29 Leo Rising represents uh, noblesse oblige or the noble obligation. So there is a strong sense of principle and integrity and character and all the important things that people uh, are supposed to operate by when they don't have uh, anything else to work with or when they have everything else to work with but ultimately it's about the character uh, of the person as they move through life uh, the noble obligation right the grand magnanimous gestures that we do to help and champion the underdog people who can't do for themselves so we should see a lot of this commitment to being literally the bigger better person in the situation from Lilibet as she goes through life which I think is a phenomenal fantastic thing and again sidebar that's it exactly not who the other one that everybody wants to believe is 29 Leo rising was. Okay. <laughs> now, if she, no, not if she is with 29 Leo rising, her chart ruler is now the sun. Her sun is at 14 Gemini in the 10th house. So this is going to make her very visible in the world. So everything that she does with the 10th house sun is going to be about trying to position herself in a way that earns and merits the respect of other people because the 10th house sun is all about respect from others one way or another, but it's always about respect. They need that measurement, that external measurement that they've done something good and right, you know, and that the world un appreciates and acknowledges that. So that's your 10th house sun. And that's what we have a little bit. So with 29 Leo rising and this determination to be the bigger, better person in situations and to live by her principles, you know, the noblesse oblige of Leo rising, and the 10th house sun, we can expect from her that she will make most of her efforts about doing things that inspire and merit respect from other people. And that is a beautiful thing. Now, uh, will her efforts be easy or difficult? Well, in her case, they should be relatively easy. And we can also see some indication about where this might be coming from. And because right here, sun, her sun is trining her Neptune and it's sextiling her moon. So with the sun trining Neptune, we can expect her to see, uh, we can expect to see her involved in causes and championing the underdog and people who can't stand up for themselves, uh, which is fantastic. We need more crusaders in life, right? Um, with the sun sextile moon in that eighth, and that's in the seventh. So she will partner, I'm sure with uh, charitable organizations and also with Pallas Athene and that Neptune together in that seventh house, I would imagine she's going to partner with uh, charitable organizations that are specific to both uh, justice for people who don't have access to resources for justice, um, which because everybody know, at least around here, the, you know, the color of justice is not black or white, but green for money. So there's that. So she could be involved in reforms or championing, you know, reforms and organizations and partner with organizations that champion reforms and uh, work towards justice, you know, for people who need it and deserve it and can't get it. It could also be that she gets involved in organizations that are very much about uh, proactively supporting and championing women's rights, which again, we're all about too. So the sun sextiling the moon, right? And Chiron in the eighth house also gives us some sense that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot more personal investment for her in the things that she does. And also this may be something that comes very specifically with issues she's personally dealing with because of the Chiron involvement. We don't know what that is. Um, and here's where it gets tricky when you're doing ch natal charts for children. We don't want to speculate too much. So we don't want to put crazy ideas in parents' heads because parents are already nuts. So any parent that is not terrified that they're going to do a bad job of raising their kids is an egomaniac and probably going to be a bad parent, but that's a whole other conversation. So if you're terrified of doing a bad job raising your kids, it's okay. Like that's good because you're, you're thinking about it. You're actively concerned that you want to do a better job. All right. 
So with Sun, Moon, Sextile, and Sun, Neptune, Trine, and we've got Aries and Pisces involved in this mix, and the 7th and the 8th and the 10th, I would absolutely expect her to get involved in uh, causes and organizations and partner with groups that actively champion and spearhead and initiate changes and uh, reforms and, you know, all those beautiful things, good, solid causes. Okay, so... There you go. Now, here's the thing, though. When you're talking to a parent about this, we want to remind them that we can't pigeonhole them into whatever. I mean, the, your, our children will grow into adults and find their way through life in places that work best for them in the circumstances that they find themselves in. And we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what will need championing at, by the time she's an adult. We don't know who the underdogs will be by the time she's an adult. We don't even know like how these things are going to play out in terms of structures by the time she's an adult. But what we do know is that her driving desire is going to be very much about earning the respect of other people and on merit, right? On merit. And also her compassionate nature, right? And her desire to see the see people do the right thing or to do the right thing. The personal investment about championing people who can't champion themselves. It's all going to be there and it will show whether it's in a small local level, like with just her friends or in much larger arenas. And again, that's something we can't predict because everything's dependent on the circumstances she finds herself in. So there's that. Okay, now the fourth house will give you some information about the early home environment. It will not give you all the information about the early home environment. So don't read too much into this. And if you see hard or negative aspects involving the fourth house, do not read too much into this because what is challenging for us is not necessarily challenging for other people and sometimes you can have beautiful charts with no hard aspects and still end up with a sociopath um i think it was brock turner there's a a, a frat boy born with a silver spoon in his mouth that raped a girl at a college party and if you look at his chart he's got a grand trident fire and all sorts of you know, beautiful things to chart. There's nothing, there's no major hard aspects to point a finger at. So he was born with every advantage of the world. So, you know, if you were just glancing over the chart, you wouldn't necessarily see that, you know, he has turned into who he is. So don't read too much into the fourth house when you look at it, but we will, we can get some information. So with the fourth house, she's got Scorpio ruling the fourth house, which means Mars is the ruler of the fourth house. So Mars in the 11th house, Mars again, trines that Neptune and Pallas. So the early home environment should be one that's very supportive and very easy for her, So right? We like that um, because Mars and Neptune are in trine. So, and she should also get along very well with her brother. Um, Mars is also, look at this, Mars is also opposing Pluto right here. So that Mars, Pluto, now, and this is what's interesting, right? So that Mars-Pluto opposition, what we would look for is the possibility that there are struggles or power plays within the home or the early environment. So there are some serious cautions, uh, warning flags that are going off here. And it may not be power plays or struggles, but certainly there's something challenging that's occurring in the home environment that's a dominant theme throughout that. Well, in her particular case, this could also be uh, health issues. So she may be dealing with some health issues or somebody in the family may be dealing with some health issues during her early years. Now, and this is the thing with reading ch charts for children. We cannot, one, don't panic the parents. Two, we don't have exact specific information. Uh, so we really don't want to go out on a limb and make people upset, right? Uh, and the other is you could be wrong. I mean, here's the most important thing to understand about being an astrologer. You could be wrong right? So if you have to be wrong, let's try not to be wrong about things that unnecessarily scare the crap out of people. <laughs> so with this Mars-Pluto opposition right here, we know, and this rule in your early home environment, we know there are some challenges, some formidable challenges and struggles that this child is going to be experiencing in their early home life and causing some turbulence and turmoil. Now, we know that mom went through all sorts of stuff with the, the, the father's family, um, before she even came out of the womb. So we don't imagine that that's over yet. And there's also the possibility that there's something about her and her physical health that is challenging or is a struggle through the early years. Uh, and it could be any number of things. So what we would say in situations like that is to be aware 
that the early home environment for the child could be a struggle or a challenge. There are some things operating here that are make the early environment challenging. So the parents are going to need to be aware that they may need to be more supportive to help her get through this. Now, with this trying to Neptune, being more supportive is going to be very easy. So there's no issues there. One of the things you're going to notice is that we've got late degrees on all the angles. So in the first couple of years, we've got major life changes happening. Um, but it's not necessarily external life changes. So the thing about it is if we had planets on the angle, which we do right here, we would look for something in the physical environment to change. So with the Jupiter very close to the descendant, right, but in a different sign, we would look for a, some type of physical change in the environment in the first couple of years of life. Okay, all the other changes, when you see late degrees like this and no planets on the angles, what that means, that there's gonna be a, a shift in the child's expression um, in a couple of years. How that plays out is another thing entirely and would take a lot more work and time that we're doing here. So if you're not sure, don't say it. All right, now the other thing that indicates the early home environment or the early childhood is the moon. So the moon rules a lot of stuff. It's not just the early childhood and the mother. The moon also represents your learning abilities. It represents your memory. It re represents your subconscious. It represents the people at large around you. It represents your daily habits. Wow, it's a long, long list of things that the moon rules. One of the things included on the list is the early childhood. So with the moon conjuncting Chiron in the eighth house representing the early childhood. And remember, we already know we've got this going on in the early environment, early home environment. There's the distinct possibility that there is some type of medical issue uh, that's going to dominate or be the running theme for Lilibet throughout her early childhood. Now, when you're reading charts for infants, <laughs> Uh, it's a little tricky because they just got born, like just yesterday. Um, so many of these these things have not had a, had a chance to manifest. And again, we don't want to panic the parents because there's the real possibility that you could be wrong. We could be wrong. When the child's a little older, it's easier because then when we talk about this, right, whatever this is that might be a medical issue in the early childhood, the parents often have had enough time that they can look back and say, oh, yeah, no, it was this, it was that, it was whatever, or no, no, nothing happened, nothing at all. In this case, because she's literally only a couple months old, it, not, none of this, well, a lot of this has not had a chance to come to fruition yet, so we're speculating. So when you're speculating about things that are sensitive like this, one of the things we would probably do is just make sure the parents are aware that they might need to be just a little bit more vigilant, pay a little bit more attention to anything that's a little off, you know, about the child and their condition in the first uh, year, you know, or first few months. And there are some things that we see with her chart we're going to talk about in a, in a another slide but just for now with the moon with this combined with this right we know this is more likely going to be issues with her physical body as opposed to the environment or her parents or anything like that so it's not like the parents are going to get divorced or somebody's going to die or you know the house is going to burn down or anything weird like that it, i mean it could happen <laughs> but i suspect this is something more manageable all right the next thing we look at when we look at a, a chart, right, especially with children, because the other thing too is we want to kind of keep this general, we want to kind of keep this up and positive, um, because unless the parent is specifically asking for specific information, and more important, you have confidence that this parent is not going to be a neurotic mess and take what you give them for information and totally misuse this and make the child a bigger mess. Unless you have that kind of confidence, sometimes it's better just to stay within general guidelines, right? Because the child needs a chance to explore and define themselves beyond the expectations of the parent and the world. All right. So the only planet she really has that's angular. And when I say angular, I mean literally on the angle, not in an angular house, right? But on an angle. She's got Jupiter right there in Pisces on that seventh house cusp. So we know that with her, Jupiter is going to play a very strong role in who she is and how she expresses herself. With Jupiter and Pisces on the seventh house, she's going to be a very loving, trusting young lady. And this may or may not be an issue in her lifetime because when you're loving and trusting like this, especially when it comes to other people, you know, other people tend to be very selfish and opportunistic and that can lead to problems. 
So one of the things we would look at with that is we would want to talk to the parents and mention that she'll be very loving and trusting and maybe a little gullible um, because she does have a Mercury Neptune square, by the way. Put this in here for you. So she has a Mercury Neptune square, which makes her a little gullible. And with that Jupiter on the seventh house, what that means is that she is more prone to getting taken advantage of by people because she literally does not think like an opportunist or a predator. It's not her nature uh, to be selfish or figure out how to, to hustle people. That's just not her thing. Because remember, 29 Leo rising, noble obligation, like literally living up to your highest principles. That in combination with this, it's going to be tricky. So the parents should know uh, early on, they're going to have to teach her about how some people in the world operate very selfishly, selfish, selfish, so oh God, I can't talk this morning, selfishly um, and or with their own agendas in mind. So that, you know, there's, it's good to be optimistic and have confidence in people, but at the same time, she has to learn as a survival mechanism how to read people better. So giving there's a difference between giving people the benefit of the doubt and throwing them the whole rope, the boat and everything and the keys to the engine, right? So that's going to be a thing. Now with this Jupiter, now here's the thing though, right? With Jupiter here on an angle being very prominent chart, it's also making this beautiful trine to her Venus. And again, it further reinforces this very loving, nurturing nature. It's not her nature to be cruel or mean or selfish or opportunistic. She's really a very gentle, um, loving little sunflower of a person, which is a beautiful thing, right? So I just want to, I, I hate bringing this man's name up. Good God, I hate bringing his name up. But here's an example of how this expresses itself. So we know the orangutan in charge in 2016, right? He also had Venus in Cancer. They both had Venus in Cancer, but here's the difference, right? He had Venus and Saturn conjunct in Cancer, okay? Venus with Saturn together in Cancer uh, and with all the other stuff in the chart, but specifically that particular combination of planets can make a person very cruel and emotionally cold, right? Very walled off emotionally. Everything in their life is about conditional love. This is not what she's operating with. She has Venus and Jupiter and Venus is I think exalted and Jupiter is in its ancient sign of rulership. So this is somebody who is literally coming into this world with an open heart uh, and wants to give and receive genuine unconditional love, which is wonderful. And it's going to be very uh, inspiring and beneficial and helpful and healing for a lot of people. But you can also see on the other side of that, how this could be personally problematic for her as the wolves come, you know, slinking through the woods in her direction because they can see her light in the darkness and that they want that. So that's something that we would talk to the parents about, you know, about being aware. And also that means that the parents are going to have to be much more aware about who she gets herself involved with and think about how best to approach these things. Uh, so that she'll actually listen, right? Because this Jupiter, Jupiter in Pisces, the planet in position of faith, she's got just an unlimited well of faith in people, uh, which <laughs> can be problematic. Okay. Now, the other things we look at is, do, does the person have any planets in rulership? Because planets in rulership are going to make it even stronger, right? So we know for her, She's got Mercury in Gemini and she's got Neptune in Pisces. Both of these planets are in rulership, which makes them doubly strong. Mercury in Gemini is going to give her a very fast mind. So she should be an early talker or at least an early thinker. But the communication and the mental functions are going to be very heavily accented in this lifetime. And for whatever reason, because it's conjunct the part of fortune, it's uh, the way her brain works, the way she communicates, the way she thinks, This the mental plane for her and how it functions and operates is going to be very important in terms of uh, her position and status in life because it's in the 10th house. So we don't know how that's going to play out. We'll see. We'll see. But it will definitely be significant, more significant than if Mercury was in any other sign. All right. Neptune is in Pisces in that seventh house. It's conjunct Pallas. And again, it's Pallas Athene is the warrior goddess. She is the champion, you know, and the, the, the leader of justice. So with 
Neptune in rulership in conjuncting Pallas Athene, we're also looking at somebody because Neptune is the underdog and the scapegoat and the unfortunate, Les Miserables. With Neptune in Pisces, there's a very strong theme of working with the disadvantaged, you know, or, or being a role model or inspiration or something uh, that makes her a pinpoint of light for the more disadvantaged as they go through the world. Now, she also has two other planets that are in rulership, but these are considered ancient rulerships. So if you're not familiar with the ancient rulers of these signs, planetary rulers of these signs, you may have missed it. So Jupiter is the ancient ruler of Pisces and Saturn is the ancient ruler of Aquarius. Before we discovered the modern planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, they didn't exist. So those signs, or I'm sorry, those planets had two signs that they ruled over. With Jupiter and Pisces uh, in ancient rulership and on that seventh house cusp, we know this is a huge magnified energy in her chart. So that Jupiter and Pisces conjunct the seventh house is going to be a big dominating factor in who she is. And we just talked all about what that Jupiter and Pisces looks like. Saturn is also in its sign of ancient rulership. Now Saturn is here in the sixth house. Remember the sixth house is the house of habits and hygiene, physical hygiene. So when it comes to physical wellness and um, our habits and our daily routines, so Saturn in the sixth shows us that there's a, uh, a greater sense of responsibility or obligation or rigidity, like a, 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 like a strict kind of organization of the routine that has to be in place or rather will be in place in this lifetime. This can also indicate somebody who does does not do well with subordinates. So some of her biggest problems are gonna be from the people who work for her. Um, and I know nobody wants to hear that, right? Now, interestingly, one of the challenges for her, I mean, I guess if we have to have a Saturn Uranus square, we gotta stick it somewhere, right? So she's got that Saturn in the sixth squaring Uranus and Cirrus in the ninth. Saturn in the sixth is going to indicate something to do with physical hygiene or physical habits, like the daily routine is going to be very rigid and structured. It is squaring Uranus and Cirrus in the ninth house. So this could indicate some issues with uh, international affairs. So it may be an issue of citizenship. Not sure what that's about. Um, also with Cirrus, Cirrus represents the mother uh, and Saturn Uranus square involving Cirrus indicates a complicated relationship with the mother. Uh, and not an easy one um, because there's nothing about Saturn and Uranus that's in square to each other that's easy. With the sixth and the ninth, um, I'm not completely sure what to think of that. So I would just say that there would be a complicated relationship with the mother uh, and her you know, daily routines and habits are gonna certainly be very strict and rigid um, as those things go. And also too, servants and employees are going to be a source of issues. Uh, for her throughout her lifetime. So she'll have to, uh, she'll have to be aware that that is a possibility. Like nobody's life is a bed of roses all the time. So there's always a flying ointment somewhere. And for her, it's, it's housekeeping and service people, right? Now the upside to this is that this problematic Saturn that squares Uranus, okay, let's get rid of that, is also sextiling that moon in the eighth house. So she's got lots of support available to her. There's a lot of things that are going to be there in place to help her function and survive. Um, so it's not all bad, uh, but again, this rigidity, I would expect this rigidity and structure, really hy hyper structured environment to be a source of uh, contention for her, especially being a Gemini. Like she's not interested in being you know, corralled and contained, but she may not have a whole, a whole lot of choice in this matter. So her environment and her ability to move around uh, may be very strictly limited um, for many reasons. And that would be a source of, of irritation for her, certainly. Okay, now, one of the other things we can look at is hemisphere emphasis. So we're talking about, you know, up or down, and then we're talking about left or right, east, west, north, south. So with her, her hemisphere emphasis, because she's pretty balanced left and right. So the hemisphere emphasis in this case is at the top of the chart. So the top of the chart, when you've got most of your planets on the top or um, 
more of them on the top than you do the bottom, indicates a very public life. This is somebody who's out and active and participating in the world outside of the house a lot. Um, if it were the other way around and her planets were all down here in the bottom of the chart, this would be somebody who's very private and, you know, uh, like to keep to themselves and stay away from the world, kind of sheltered and hide in their cave. But with all this upper hemisphere emphasis, this is somebody who's going to have a very public life and it will be very visibly on display her entire life and be very active out there in the world. So it will be interesting to see what she does with herself and how she uh, interacts with the world with this much upper hemisphere or outer world emphasis. And the last thing we would look at just as a general overview is the chart pattern, which is literally how these planets are, you know, laid out in a chart. So there's, there's what they call a bucket, right? We've got all planets here and you've got a single planet over here. There's what they call a seesaw where you've got planets here and then the rest of the planets here. So it literally looks like a seesaw. There's just a bunch of different planetary patterns or chart patterns that a chart can follow. In her particular case, it's considered a bowl. So her Pluto and her Mars, that problematic Pluto Mars that we saw that ruled her fourth house, this becomes the horns of the bowl, right? Or the, the outer rims of the bowl. And all the other planets fall between Mars and Pluto. So this makes not only Mars and Pluto very important, even more so because it rules an angle right? Both of these planets rule this angle, right? That's very important. Uh, also because the midpoint falls somewhere over here, but mostly let's stick with some basics. Mars and Pluto both rule that fourth house. So one of the things that we know is that her, uh, chart her chart expression and her life expression is absolutely going to go back to and be informed and molded by her early home environment. So her early years, for her more than anybody else, her early years are going to be instrumental in determining the course and uh, trajectory of her life and how she evolves into her chart. So, okay. Okay, so here are some just random things looking at the chart. So things that I expect to see when she grows into adulthood is one that I expect her to be tall and lean with a fast metabolism, although not necessarily athletically inclined. Now she may have a possible lifetime of hearing or sound sensitivity issues. I'm expecting frequent drainage tubes in her ears when she's young or sinus problems or, or both. They're actually connected. Um, and the possibility of bacterial infections affecting her hearing. Now here's the thing. Remember we talked about, um, negative, you know, speculation in a chart when we're looking at charts and how we have to be very careful about this. So when we present this, we present this as a possibility, not an absolute uh, reality or fact, right? Or an absolute prediction. The other thing is that we would, we would frame this in a way that the parents understand that this is a stronger possibility for her than with other children or, you know, or the other child. Uh, and also just something that they need to be aware of so that they can try to work with it, right? To, pre to lessen the incidences of it or minimize the, the damage from these things if they do occur. And also, again, always remind them you could be wrong. The doctor is the best medical professional and s expert source when it comes to physical issues. So continuing on, um, also, there's the possibility that she'll have a disposition of migraines, although I think this might be less likely, or if it occurs, it might be connected to that. Uh, she should be attractive. Um, oh, she certainly would be fair of face um, and attractive it will certainly help. Uh, I expect her also to be sexually precocious in a clinical experimental way, um, not hypersexual, but that may be misinterpreted as such. Now, here's where it also gets a little sensitive. Anytime you talk about sex and children with their parents, parents get a little freaking weird, especially depending on what the parents value system, sophistication or moral compass is built around. So you may or may not want to bring this up. Now I'm bringing this up because it's there, but also too, because it's something that's going to be easily misunderstood or willfully misunderstood depending on who she's dealing with. Remember, she's very trusting, right? This child is a very loving, trusting child. So being sexually precocious in loving, trusting children can be problematic because the wolves are out in the woods looking for these kids. So 
The thing to understand with this is that sexually precocious in a clinical experimental way just means checking things out to see what's there. Like, what's that about? It's not the same thing as adult sexuality. And it is absolutely not the same thing as being hypersexual. So if you think the parents can handle that type of information, you can certainly bring this up. If you're concerned that the parents might be like weird about this, then just don't talk about it at all and let them sort it out. There's been some really really horrible things that parents have done to small children like toddlers and stuff who have just been exploring their bodies because that's what babies and toddlers do it's a brand new body where the we're, we're all apart how does this work um and have you know lost their children and been gone to prison for child abuse for some of the ridiculous ignorance uh with which they were operating because they thought that child exploring their body was some type of you know, adult activity and needed to be cut off immediately, even though the child was a toddler. So yeah, it's, it's people are weird. So be careful with that. But in her case, this is what it is. And like I said, because our general nature is very loving and trusting, this could be something that is willfully misinterpreted by predatory adults and older children. So that is something the parents should be aware of um, in terms of managing and safeguarding for her. Um, also, things that we see with her is I see that she should be very close and have very loving support with her siblings, although I think it's sibling. I don't think she's going to have any more uh, siblings after Archie. I think it's just Archie. Um, and also her father. Her mother, on the other hand, uh, is definitely going to be an issue, which, listen, to be fair, most of us have mom issues, honestly. <laughs> most of our issues are from our mothers. Um, but the mother will be an issue. And surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly the mother may also be a source of anxiety development so again you know gauge the parent and if this is something you can even possibly bring up without freaking them out um, and if it is you know present it as something that they should be aware of so that they can work on themselves and safeguarding to minimize the effects or damage that could come from things that contribute to this some things we can't help listen you can look at a chart and see everything happening you can make all the predictions in the world and be right about them and walk right into it right i can't tell you how many times we've watched transits happen it's like oh watch out for these dates people are gonna be a little wacko blah 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 and literally i've, I've caught myself afterwards doing exactly the thing i warned people other people were going to act like so sometimes we can't help it we're just part of the, the 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 great cosmic play but you know at least if we understand what's happening we have the ability to make some amends or rectify or minimize you know the fallout afterwards which is different from walking around completely ignorant and blind to what's going on and often confused because we're like wait what i don't understand what happened so there's that <laughs> and that's how we're gonna kind of go through a chart reading for a child um we can certainly get into some stuff parents are always going to ask you the same questions you know will my child be successful what will they do for a living will they have a happy marriage will i have many grandkids <laughs> will they be around to take care of me when I'm old and crazy? Um, and some of these things we can answer with a chart, some of these things that we, ca we can't, because no matter what we see in the child's chart, when we talk about the relationship with parents, then we have to pull the two charts together and look at the relationship between two individuals. You may have given birth to this human being, but that is still a spiritually whole human being with their own evolutionary agenda in this lifetime. So uh, it is not uncommon for parents and children to not like each other it is not uncommon for parents and children to look at each other like the other one dropped off of the planet mars and how are we related to each other these things happen because we're talking about two distinct individuals if you're lucky you get parents and children who are simpatico with each other so there's none of that weirdness but in situations where there is that weirdness there's a lot of personal growth that is being forced because of that relationship. So never underestimate the value of difficult relations because those difficult relationships are the ones that act as a pumice stone, right? To kind of grind you down and, and polish you and make you smoother and more clear and true in terms of who you are. It's a, it's a growth experience and growth, like cutting your teeth and having growing pains in your bones. It's never, painless so there's that okay so i wanted to do something fun we're going to talk about chart patterns because this is a very easy thing to spot and it's a lot of fun to do and with her it's very very special right so with her chart pattern one of the things that we're looking at is again we've got mars and pluto right containing all these planets 
and what is Mars and Pluto rule? Both of them together rule that fourth house cusp, making it super, super important because it's an angle. First, four, first, fourth, seventh, and tenth. All the angles, anything ruling the angles is even more amplified. Now, with Mars and Pluto as the horns or the rim of the, the bowl pattern, we also know that the moon Uranus midpoint is the mid planet degree. So for here, let me change colors. The midpoint or the mid, the, literally the middle spot between the moon and Uranus, okay, is our mid planet degree or the, the moon Uranus midpoint. Now, this is very important because the midpoint of that Mars Pluto, right, that planetary pairing is going to give us some information about how this bull pattern is going to be best expressed and also where it's sensitive. Anytime we've got a transit occurring at this 27 degree, whether it's Libra, right, or Aries, or Capricorn, or Cancer, anything at the 27th degree is going to be very, very sensitive and trigger this bull pattern. With the midpoint at 27 Aries, we're not worried so much about the sign and degree. That's, a, that's just a mathematical placeholder, so we know where that is. What we're really looking at is a combination of Moon and Uranus. So with Moon and Uranus as the, the midpoint for Moon and Uranus being very, very important to this bull pattern and also pulling in Chiron right here and Cirrus with it, right? We know that there is something very, very important here that is going to involve uh, progressive things, things that take us into the future, also things that are completely unexpected and disruptive, and also possibly health or medical conditions, right? So medical technologies and motherhood, uh, all of these things play into this midpoint with a bull pattern. So in this lifetime, I wouldn't be surprised if her life is heavily dominated by themes involving motherhood, reproduction, tech, was it medical technology, te technological progress, cutting edge sort of science, um, and also issues of nurturing, right? And, and what is what I'm looking for? Um, taking care of the underdog. Again, championing the underdog, championing people who can't do for themselves sort of thing. And with that Mars Pluto, because it is the midpoint of the Mars Pluto, which rules that fourth house, I would also say that these things all, again, go back to early childhood environments. So it will be interesting to see what she goes through in her first years of life, uh, because that may give us a clue as to the direction she will be heading in later when she's an adult and able to participate in the world. Okay, the other thing too I wanted to point out is wherever we find Pluto, right? We also find the importance of legacy as their life path. So Pluto is here, right? And it's on that sixth house cusp, but more importantly, it is part of this bull pattern, right? And that midpoint. So for her, because Pluto is very much prominent because of the bull pattern position, because it is one of the rims of the bowl, Pluto absolutely means that in this lifetime, legacy is going to be very important to her. What she leaves behind for other people uh, to work with is going to be very important. And legacy doesn't just mean money. Legacy is um, literally everything that we do that, that changes or alters the course of the future for other people, right? The people we leave behind. So people who make um, it, social activists, right? And like civil rights activists. Uh, are classic examples of legacies, right? The uh, foundations, the, the monetary, financial, physical buildings that, and foundations that people leave behind, those are obvious legacies. Um, myths and legends, Josie Wales, the outlaw, left behind a legacy, right? All of these things are, are things that we leave behind that impact and, and inspire or assist, yeah, or not assist. <laughs> um, people that we leave behind, El Chapo, right? The criminal, the, the Colombian drug lord, uh, it, the larger than life escape artist character, he, when he goes, will leave legacy behind, right? So legacy is an amazing thing. And it's all about what you leave behind for other people. So she will have legacy as an important part of her life as well. Now, 
some people, I thought this was interesting, I wanted to show you some examples. People who have outer planets involved in their bowl patterns, right? Typically, remember, outer planets have everything to do with transcendence and other people and things that are well above and beyond I, me, mine. So this is well beyond ourselves and our local communities and our immediate families. This is There's something about that outer planet that demands uh, that we become uh, like a like a conduit for things that are much bigger than our small tiny worlds, right? Ella Fitzgerald is a, a very well-known singer who has left a tremendous legacy herself. Now she has a bowl planner with the outer planets Uranus and Neptune at the horn. So for Ella Fitzgerald, Uranus and Neptune, it looks like little eyes, form the horns of her bowl. And Mercury and Jupiter, sorry, Mercury and Jupiter represents the middle planets of this bowl, right? So what do we know about Ella Fitzgerald? Well, with Uranus and Neptune, or let me start backwards. So with Mercury and Jupiter as the midpoints, midpoint planets, uh, obviously, singing and entertainment, singing and entertainment was absolutely a huge part of who she was, right? With Uranus and Neptune, this is where the outer planet stuff comes in. With Uranus and Neptune, there should have been something unearthly about her voice and something unifying on a large scale about her voice and certainly something very powerful because it's Uranus. Um, and something magnetic or mesmerizing. And she certainly, Ella Fitzgerald, did have a tremendously powerful voice, but she also had a very hypnotic quality to her voice. And singing and entertainment was the vehicle with which these outer planets expressed themselves. Pretty interesting, huh? All right, let me get rid of that. And here, Alfred Hitchcock is another one. And this is, again, he's got Pluto involved, so there's a lot of legacy. So Alfred Hitchcock is a film producer and a screenwriter with Saturn and Pluto at the horns of his bowl. So he's got Saturn here and Pluto here, and these, they're the outer planets of the bowl. Mars, for him, is the midpoint planet. So with Mars the midpoint planet, we would expect Martian or Mars type activities, right? Well, we do, because what is Alfred Hitchcock famous for? <laughs> scaring the crap out of people. Literally, murders, mysteries, suspense, thrillers, all about murder and aggression and hostility, Urgh. right? Murders, mysteries, thrillers, and suspense. Very, very Mars. Now, it could easily have been sports, certainly, um, or war or spy novels, but for him, it was, it was this, and it still absolutely comes under Mars' domain. Now, with Saturn and Pluto as the rims of the bowl, what we get is somebody who is uh, both very structured and prone to solitary work, as well as somebody who is deep, deep under the surface of things to look at what's happening. And that's exactly what he did. As a writer, that's, in case you don't know, writing is a very solitary, lonely profession. You can't write with other people. You gotta do it by yourself. And with Pluto, this going under the surface, psychological thrillers, horror, all of this stuff had deep, deep psychological underpinning, underpinnings and themes, which is what made his work so compelling. Also too, remember, Pluto's legacy and Alfred Hitchcock absolutely left a legacy behind because his work transformed film and cinematography as it has been done because up until him it was has always been done a certain way when he came on the scene he completely changed everything turned the whole table over and uh, did everything completely differently and as a result of his work and his innovations and his visions uh, the way we do film filmmaking and cinematography along with script writing all sorts of stuff has been radically transformed and that has been his legacy I wanted to find some contemporary examples for some of you who are younger and have no idea who these people are. <laughs> How that's possible, I don't know, but it could happen. Um, so also Jenna Marbles is a YouTube celebrity and now she has a bowl pattern with Sun, Jupiter and Uranus 
with your opposed by Chiron is the mid planet. So she's got Sun, Jupiter here, right? And she has Uranus and Chiron as the midpoint planets, right? So with the Sun and Jupiter, self glorification and entertainment, self glorification and entertainment would absolutely be the things that we see expressed through her bull pattern. Right. With Uranus as the midpoint planet, we're definitely seeing two things. One, um, shock value. So shocks and surprises. And she definitely came on the scene as completely unexpected. And also truth. Remember, I keep I keep harping on this because Uranus is the great revealer. It is the truth bringer. It is the inconvenient truth that pops up the worst possible times. So one of the things that we know about Jenna Marbles is that she's been, she did what a lot of YouTubers, especially the females who are very glam appearing on camera, what they don't do. And that's what she was very honest about who she was and what she looked like without her makeup on, um, which was completely unexpected and compelling. I thought it was really brave <laughs> and took a lot of integrity to do that. Um, now she's been in trouble for some other things, you know, and she's has since given up her channel, but that whole sun, Jupiter, Uranus, right? Entertainment through shock value um, was definitely a huge part of who she is. Now you could also probably say that Howard Stern would fall under that description as well, right? Because certainly self glorification and entertainment and shock value. Uh, but with Howard Stern, I'm not a fan of Howard Stern. Um, we would have to look at his chart. I haven't looked at his chart and I don't expect that that's the case because Howard Stern has his personal issues with women, very misogynistic garbage thinking that he spews in his thing and makes it entertainment. So he's a whole different animal. Anyway, <laughs> um, other contemporary examples, Ludacris, who is a famous musician, has Jupiter and Neptune as the horns with Moon Mercury. as the midpoint planets. So again, Mercury is the songs and the singing. The moon is actually, so he's similar to Ella Fitzgerald, but different because the moon is very homey, like or, uh, places of origin, early environment. And of course, Jupiter and Neptune, um, entertainment and escapism and, and fantasy. So one of the things that's notable about Ludacris is that his most famous albums have everything to do with the Dirty South, right? Or what is it, the hot Atlanta hip hop uh, scene. Um, Ludacris has a couple of really, you should look him up, he's amazing. Country Grammar is one of the albums, but his breakthrough albums, which are still much loved, are very much uh, um, influenced by the Southern environment he found himself in uh, and the way these songs are constructed, just beautiful, amazing stuff. So there's that moon Mercury right there. Now Jupiter and Neptune, again, Jupiter's entertainment and Neptune is also music, by the way and the arts. So that all makes complete sense. So entertainment and escapism through homegrown heart appeal has been his signature and his music was known for an entire generation as the music that brought the Dirty South culture up to public celebration. Now, I just want to say here, I'm not saying the Dirty, dirty South in a derogatory way. I'm saying the Dirty South in a colloquial way that apparently has been used by other people. So forgive me. <laughs> forgive me if it sounds awful. It's not my term. All right, and finally, I have another example. Uh, Dominic Cruz, who's a famous mixed martial arts fighter. Now he has the moon and Mars as the horn of the bull, right? And Jupiter is the midpoint planet. So quick reflexes, right? Which is moon and Mars. The moon is reaction or response time. Mars is absolutely your reflexes and physical movement. So moon and Mars together here is the, the horns of the bull means that his reaction time, his response time, his quick reflexes are absolutely a big theme and signature for him. Jupiter rules sports. So his quick reaction time in sports has been his hallmark and signature. Now, could this have been anything else? Sure, absolutely. And it certainly could have been any other sport, but this was his sport of choice. And that's where that bull pattern really shines and expresses itself. And because it has an arena that makes sense for it to be expressed, he's done very, very well in that regard. So this next segment are some critical dates that I think are important to watch for Lilibet uh, as they're upcoming. Some things that I just want to add here before we get into that 
is that based on the configurations in Lilibet's chart, she has a very specific and special purpose in this life. Now, before you, everybody gets crazy because they feel like they don't have a special like destiny purpose in their chart because they can't find it in the aspects. That's not true at all. One of the things to understand is that when we have the transpersonal planets, the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto, very strongly configured in the chart, it is a greater cross to bear because what that means is that you represent or symbolize something for a greater evolutionary purpose for other people, not who you want to represent or not who you'd like to be a symbol of. It is literally whatever they hang on you, you get to be the, uh, what is it? Like the teachers in school used to say, I'm going to make an example out of you. <laughs> so outer planet uh, prominence in a chart often means that you are the, the magnet that draws these filings to yourself in terms of circumstances and people and biases and all sorts of other things that are not ideal um, sometimes to, to work with. Uh, and part of your path in life is to work through these things because you are in many ways modeling something or you're acting as the ignition point for something much greater than yourself in terms of long-term evolution, right? So uh, an example uh, is Trump, since he and Lilibet share similar aspects here. Um, Trump carries that Sun-Uranus conjunction. Uranus is an outer planet. Uranus represents something, because, it, because it's an outer planet, represents something greater than ourselves. So it is often a catalyst, a scapegoat, an example, or an ignition point for something. And, and it's well far and beyond who we see ourselves as or who we really are. There's a part of us that becomes a reflecting point for the world at large in a much bigger picture. And in 45's case, he was the catalyst or ignition point that mirrored some very important things and set the ball in motion for larger evolutionary changes that are happening for us as a society and certainly here in this country as a democracy. So it's not that he is necessarily a genius. Sorry, folks who carry strong Uranus aspects. <laughs> it's not that he's necessarily genius as much as that Uranus because Uranus is the truth bringer. It is the, the shocking revelation, right? It is the thing that rips back the curtain. It's the lightning bolt in the darkness that suddenly illuminates everything you couldn't see before in that few seconds that it lights up the sky. His purpose in this grand cosmic drama was to act like the lightning bolt illuminating the sky. And boy, what his presence in the presidency of this country has revealed about the inner workings of our government and our culture and our country as and as it is involved with other global places right so it's the same thing and Lilibet has some major outer planetary stuff going on there's a lot of legacy involved in what she's going to accomplish in this lifetime um, large or small it will be something that will be important to people well past herself so uh, she's, she has the potential to be a powerhouse. We'll do more about her chart in another video. I want to keep this one kind of brief. Um, but she does have some issues she's got to work through in this lifetime. She has come into this life with very specific crosses to bear. Uh, and she is modeling and being a representative for things uh, that are much greater than herself. So she has the ability to be something uh, that matters, um, if not for any other reason than symbolically for another or larger group of people. So we'll see how that plays out. We will see how that plays out. I don't want to give too much away because a child has to have a chance to grow, right? Okay, so um, so again, these are all what I'm about to read. This, this is what I'm doing for myself and for you guys. Um, if I were doing this chart for an actual parent, I I would be a little cautious about going into stuff like this, largely depending on who I'm dealing with. Uh, and I would say the same for you. These are, this is not necessary information, but if you feel that the parent can handle this responsibly and not turn into a total cuckoo clock um, about it, then certainly you can share that so they can try and keep an eye on things. And again, the other thing, the other two things I want to say about this, these are my caveats. One, uh, 
because I know or I believe that Meghan Markle and Prince Harry are never going to watch my YouTube channel, like I, I would be really amazed if they were. I don't have to be quite as careful about the information I'm presenting because I can't panic the parents if the parents never hear what I'm saying. So there's that, you know, and two, as always, we can always be wrong. And unfortunately, in these particular instances, because we don't live with them, we have no way of corroborating this information. We only know what is public information or what they give to the press for public information. So we have no way of confirming or denying that any of these things transpired or, or came to, to pass. So consider that as well. So if we don't hear anything, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. If we do hear something, well, then we'll know, right? Anyway. So for Lilibet, in the first two months of life, month one and month two, uh, I see some issues with fevers and sickness um, and possible life threats. Uh, we've got a Moon, Chiron, Mars, Pluto, Orcus, Jupiter thing happening. I'm not going to get into specific details about how these configurations work, and I came to these conclusions. Um, I, I'm just going to say that it's there, and I don't want you guys practicing medical astrology. And again, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, which is also why I'm not getting into how we came to these conclusions because I don't want anybody running off. And I just saw somebody on Facebook do this, uh, took something I said at its most simplistic form and ran with it uh, to do interpretations of other things using this really simplistic interpretation of a formula I used. Um, and it was uh, it was just it was not it was not OK. It was not OK. And it was very misplaced, well-intentioned, but misplaced. Uh, and when I told her about it, she got mad at me because I didn't realize who she was. Uh, but apparently she was a follower on my YouTube channel and after I gave her the business because I didn't realize that's where she got it from because um, I just knew whatever she was doing was wrong. She unfollowed me because my count, my follower count dropped one like immediately and I'm like, oh, OK, so now I know where you got that from. So with that said, I'm not going to get into how these things play together um, and how I've come to that conclusion. Just these are notes for me. Sorry. And this is why I'm not telling you. <laughs> OK. Now, also, too, with Nililibet, I would look for major life changes at six months and four years. Now, there's a possible change of residence or major family disruption around those times. Um, not completely sure what it is. And we could pinpoint this. However, in order to do that, what we would actually have to do is look at everybody's charts. We would have to look at the natal charts for Harry, Meghan, and Archie. We'd have to look at their solar returns and their progressions, as well as Lilibet's solar return and progressions for those times. Um, and then, of course, other, you know, lunar returns to like that get it narrowed down even more. That's a lot of extra work, which I'm not going to do because we we're talking days and days and days and days of analysis just to figure out what specifically might transpire. And for this video, we don't need to know specifically what it is. We just need to know that six months and four years are mile markers. And there's some type of uh, or there's a strong possibility of some type of change of residence or major family disruption occurring around this time. So and also, you know, it's kind of fun to have a little bit of mystery. So we'll see. We will wait and see how this plays out. Um, also, uh, we've got a 211 square uh, eight in eight from 10 and seven. Yeah, yeah. Those are my notes. Ignore them. <laughs> Let me just do this right now. Just ignore that. Those are my notes. Um, again, six months out. Right uh, in with her progress chart. Her chart ruler is going to change from Leo to Virgo, which means that our chart ruler will change from will change to Mercury squaring Neptune and her regressed Mercury sextile ascendant, which is all a big data dump. I'm so sorry. But this is to say that at six months, there is a major change in how she expresses herself uh, and also the possibility of some confusion uh, going on with this um, and certainly involving that Mercury Neptune square. Uh, and again, we'd have to get into real, real specifics and a lot of charts to analyze to figure out what exactly that is. But just know that with this, because we've got double confirmation that six months is a critical time, that something significant, really significant is going to happen about six months. And finally, the other thing that we got to watch, because remember this Mars Pluto are the rims of the bowl, right? And she's got a Mars Pluto opposition from her fifth to 11th. Now the poor little rich girl syndrome, enter the fourth, the poor little rich girl syndrome, uh, is not a derogatory statement. Poor little rich girl syndrome or, or little rich boy syndrome is when someone has all the resources in the world, but not necessarily anyone that genuinely loves them or can ever really be sure that anyone in their life actually loves them, right? So do people love me or do they love me for my resources? And I imagine that a lot of people with money go through this, but this is at a whole other level for her. And this is going to dominate 
uh, the better part of her life and be problematic for her. So learning to read people is going to be extremely important and having a strong, supportive family environment with, full of unconditional love and support is going to be even more important for her mental health. Okay, because, you know, never being able to trust anybody around you is a very dis destabilizing thing. Um, so there's that. And remember, too, we talked about this. She's a very loving, trusting person. You know, it's not her nature, you know, to to look at people with this opportunistic kind of eye like, mm, what's in for me? Like, that's not her nature at all. So she is more susceptible to being taken advantage of than other people. And with all the resources she should have at her disposal in her lifetime, this makes it even more difficult. And the cuts are going to run even deeper when they happen. And again, just some notes to myself. The first two months of life for her are critical. Now we are at the end of, she's born in June. We're at the end of July. Uh, so we're pretty much at the two month mark and she seems to be okay. So we're good. We're good. She's still here because we haven't heard anything un, untoward. Uh, so I'm assuming everything's beautiful. Um, at six months, we've got progress Mercury, sextile ascendant, Pluto, la, 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 oh, sorry, notes, all notes. Uh, so six months, again, is going to be a critical time and all of this is why <laughs> her second year of life is going to be the next major milestone for her. Um, now her second year of life looks like there's going to be some problems. You know, the thing with the Orcus, Orcus is a pain in the butt kind of planetoid there. One of the things with Orcus that's interesting and Orcus is heavily involved throughout here is that Orcus in mythology is the God who punished you for not keeping your word. It is the oath keeper, not like these nitwits that tried to take down the, the government, but an actual mythological oath keeper. This is the person who punished you if you broke your bond or you broke your word because your word has to have value. If you're not good for your word, you're not good for anything, right? With Orcus in her first house, very prominent in her chart, people keeping their word or keeping their promises is going to be extremely important to her. Now, with little children who are very literal, you know, people keeping their promises is always very important, always for all of them. But, you know, as we get older, people, you know, develop into who they're going to be. And then sometimes they become people who don't keep their promises. They don't really care about other people keeping their promises because they don't keep their own either. But there are still a few people who hold fast to my word is my bond. You have to keep your promises. If you said you're going to do it, you got to do it. Commitments, right? And she is going to be one of those people. And she will come down heavy uh, in a very, unfree well, not a vindictive way, not like, not like Scorpio. But she will certainly come down heavy and let you know uh, quickly that your word is your bond. And if you break your word, you're not good for anything. Because if you're not good for your word, you're not good for anything. So... I thought that was interesting. You can look up Orcus online. He's, it's an interesting character. Um, now, with a progressive ascendant conjuncting Orcus and opposing Pluto like this, right? Because the ascendant's going to move down and conjunct that. What we have is or that Orcus-Jupiter opposition in her chart coming into much tighter focus. So a much more clear focus at that time. So around the age of two, her, her investment in people being good for their word is going to become crystal clear why this is important and how this is important to her and will represent a lifelong theme uh, that she will be operating with. It will snap into existence or cement itself into her character at the age of two. Uh, so we'll look for what events happen around that time that really bring this into manifestation and crystallize this into her character. Um, and again, at six months, so we've got these two here. Oh, no, sorry. That is a repeat of what's up here. So ignore this. That's a repeat. <laughs> okay. Um, at the age of four years, we've got another major uh, life milestone happening, right? The Midhaven will change to zero Gemini and the Sun and the North Node will come together in a conjunction. Um, so typically with the Gemini Midhaven and the Sun North Node conjunction, this is usually an involvement uh, with large groups of random people. Um, so brand new people in large amounts start coming into your life at this time. Uh, for her, because of her age, she'll be four at that time, I would expect her to end up in daycare. So that may be her first introduction to daycare, which would be very significant for her and uh, very, very good. Now, in the summer of 2027, so we've got a couple years for this, um, we're looking at June through August, 
Her progressed midhaven will square Jupiter, the moon will square Neptune, and she will be six years old. So at that time, we've got Jupiter, moon, Neptune. Hang on a second. Midhaven. So this should bring other people and partnerships uh, into high focus for her. So 2020, she was born in 2021, 27 is going to make her six years old. So she'll be six years old at this time. So it's entirely possible that she may have her first schoolgirl crush when she's six. Oh, that's so cute. Um, oh, it's right there. <laughs> Uh, so I don't necessarily see this as a bad thing, although this is certainly going to be a more vulnerable time for her. Um, because again, it's activating Jupiter and it's activating Neptune. Uh, and both these she carries in her natal chart in the seventh house. So she's that Jupiter and Neptune in and of themselves are squishy, soft, vulnerable planets. Um, so it is possible that she will uh, be find herself in the company of very artistic people or she will find herself in the company of very predatory people. Um, not necessarily the same thing. So keeping an eye on her around that time is going to be very important because it's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of weirdness at this time because it's Jupiter and Neptune they're both in Pisces, um, and yeah, Pisces Jesus I love Pisces but wow it, in terms of a chart it can be a little problematic. Okay, now uh, getting back to Orcus right this Orcus now in her natal chart she's carrying Venus sextile Orcus and she's got. Jupiter opposing it. So she's got Venus, Jupiter, and Orcus as a trio in her chart uh, that involves Orcus, which makes Orcus very important. Now, the thing to understand is that Orcus will now take on the energies of Venus and Jupiter, which means that, and again, I'm saying she's not going to be vindictive about people breaking her promises. Um, she will be a very gentle, compassionate teacher, but she will absolutely, because Venus rules our values and Jupiter represents our ethics, our ideals. With Orcus, this absolutely reinforces the idea that keeping your word, uh, keeping like your word is your bond and you keep your word, right? Keep your promises is going to be an absolutely ingrained part of her nature and a, and, uh, a hallmark or a calling card of how she sees herself and how she sees the world and how you're supposed to operate in it. So that gives us hope because that definitely indicates that she should have a much more uh, elevated character than the average person, which we saw with that 29 Leo rising, and this certainly reinforces that. All right, and just to recap, just to recap, sensitive times coming up for her, I'm expecting to be the first month of life. Uh, then after that, during the second month of life, which is coming up now, as a matter of fact, um, which is also why I'm doing this video now. Uh, around August 15th, which is just a couple weeks away, we've got a lunar activation of 27 Taurus, the 27 Taurus eclipse, which will conjunct her midhaven. So I'm expecting possibly, because I don't see this, this is not going to be a negative thing. Um, I'm seeing this as possibly her first major public appearance. Whoa, because I don't believe anybody has seen hide nor hair of her yet. So let's see what happens around this time. Uh, now, now, after that, of course, in late August, the last couple of weeks of August, uh, and, and again, we won't know because we don't live with her, so there's stuff that we're not necessarily going to be privy to. I would expect the first display of divine or supernatural occurrences to manifest or display around her. Uh, <laughs> she's got a lot of, <clears throat> we all have angels and guardians around us. There's a lot of supernatural or spiritual assist around her uh, that will keep her company throughout her life because she's coming in uh, at a much higher, she's coming in at a much higher level of spiritual development than other people necessarily. Um, but when, you know, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow, when you, when there's that part of you that is meant to be for bigger things, meant for bigger purposes, meant, meant for the greater good, the challenges you face on the way to becoming the person you need to be to be able to be that instrument are much tougher. People who have been through the worst, worst circumstances and situations and events in their life always, always, well, not always, most of the time, <laughs> most of the time, uh, end up becoming transformative light bringers for other people because they had to endure those tests and they had to build up that armor and learn who these uh, predators were in the wild, right, so that they could deal with them more efficiently when they were finally called upon to do the thing that they're meant to do. 
So she's one. She is a light worker in that respect, which means that unfortunately she's going to have some really, really painful light experiences she's going to have to go through, as part of psychologically armoring up, uh, so that she is fortified and able to deal with that while she's doing what she's meant to do. So there's that. And in late August, we can see, we can expect to see some presence of the divine or the supernatural angels, guardians, guides, ancestors around her. But we won't know because we don't live with her. So. I, 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 there you go. <laughs> um, at four months old is another critical time in life. Um, now, specifically, the dates around this time are going to be October 20th, 26th and 27th of this year. Uh, at this time, we're looking at a full moon in Aries. Uh, Jupiter will station direct at the same time. Mercury will also station at the same time. You've got a packed house occurring around these days that are absolutely going to set off her chart. So anything that she's going to be dealing with in terms of life themes, right, um, or major planetary themes or, or issues in her life, we can expect to get activated around this time. Now, in October, understand that Saturn will station direct at the beginning of the month. All of your outer planets from Saturn onward, right, we feel them longer and well in advance or after a major planetary shift in direction. So, and the further out it is, the more months ahead or behind we feel that. So Saturn stationing direct at the beginning of the month, we're feeling it the entire month of October. Saturn for her rules her fifth and sixth house, which means that we're looking at possibly a health moment involving cardiac issues or possibly a change in the household uh, with whom the child, child is bonding so that could be a new caretaker or a nanny so we literally have one extreme or the other it could be a cardiac issue with a physical health that occurs this month or and especially around the 20th 26th and 27th or it could just be a change in staffing and who she's bonding with uh, in the household and this has been the natal chart interpretation for Lilibet Diana Mountbatten Windsor Windsor um, I tried to avoid repeating a lot of stuff you're going to find a hundred times over all over the internet because it's it's redundant at this point. And I wanted to give you guys something different and distinct from what you can find pretty much everywhere. Um, and I also wanted to give you guys an opportunity to kind of really think about how to read a natal chart for children and youth before you do it. Uh, so there, and remember again, <laughs> Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are probably never going to watch my channel. So we've got a little bit more leeway uh, with how we read this chart than we would if they were actually sitting in front of us. Um, if you're reading the chart for other people, that person is sitting in front of you. So not only are you able to gauge and ask to figure out what they can and can't deal with, but you also have a greater responsibility in choosing your words more carefully and just picking and choosing what you focus on to give them for information, you know, whether it's absolutely necessary or not. Okay, and that's it. Top left hand corner is a picture of Princess Diana and the boys, uh, Harry and William. And you know, the right of course is guardian angel. So uh, this has been Ms. Jenny with Primal Girl Wellness and Down to Earth Astrology. I hope you enjoyed this. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like, give me feedback, uh, subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this and share with somebody who you think might find this interesting. I hope this video was helpful to you and we will talk to you guys in the next video. Bye.